Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service, with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news, seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. You're listening to the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Oliver Conway. This edition is published in the early hours of Tuesday the 21st of November. Nearly all the employees at the chat GPT creator OpenAI threatened to resign over the sacking of their boss. This is a family. They have created something nobody has ever created before. This is not a normal tech company. This is an advancement for all of humanity, no matter how you want to look at it. Another hospital in Gaza has become caught up in the fighting with 12 people reported killed. And the UN says the world is on course for a catastrophic warming, even if countries meet their current pledges to cut emissions. Also in the podcast, Argentina's next president promises radical change, but can he deliver? And... Just when you thought the Toronto rental market couldn't get any worse, it did. I present to you, shared bedroom in a lake-facing downtown condo for $900 a month. The growth of bed sharing as a solution to rising rents. Much has been made of the potential of artificial intelligence to disrupt everything from healthcare to banking to politics. But the recent chaos at OpenAI, the firm behind ChatGPT, has a very human face. First came the shock sacking of co founder Sam Altman on Friday. Then there were reports the firm was under pressure from investors like Microsoft to take him back. Instead, it was announced that Sam Altman and his OpenAI co-founder Greg Brockman would be joining Microsoft itself. Now, we know that 735 of the 770 staff at OpenAI have signed a letter threatening to resign. Matt Schlicht is CEO of Octane AI and a friend of Sam Altman. I think that the majority of these people will quit. They love Sam. They love Greg. This is a family. They have created something nobody has ever created before. This is not a normal tech company. This is a advancement for all of humanity, no matter how you want to look at it. So where did it all go wrong? The BBC's James Clayton is in San Francisco. OpenAI started off as a not-for-profit. They did not want to produce anything or be beholden to their shareholders. They wanted to create AI for the good of humanity. But what OpenAI really needed was a lot of cloud computing. So in 2019, they put out a press release to say that to try and get access to this cloud computing, they would need a lot of investment. So they would produce a sort of hybrid company, a full-profit part and a not-for-profit part. But it was a partnership not of equals. So the not-for-profits would govern the for-profit bit of the company. And that's why you have this bizarre structure where you have Microsoft, that is a huge investor in OpenAI, that doesn't have a board seat. And you also have this bizarre situation that the not-for-profits board looks much more like a not-for-profits board. You have people there with very, very limited board experience. Plus, you only have six members of the board. So it only took four people to make this incredibly, potentially damaging move to remove Sam Altman. All of this stems from OpenAI's very curious governance structure. But there has been a a catastrophic falling out at the top there. And there's some suggestions it was over differences over how fast the company was going. Exactly. And that appears to be a key division right at the top. So you have Greg Brockman, his co-founder, Sam Altman. And then you have this key person, Ilya Sutskiva. He's this AI wonder kid. He went to open AI. He's the chief scientist. He's incredibly influential. He appears to be 
one of the main instigators of this coup. He has now tweeted that he regrets the actions that he has taken and he regrets the board's action and wants Sam Altman back. The problem is Microsoft have already said that Sam Altman can come work with Microsoft. Sam Altman's agreed, as can Greg Brockman, as can anyone else, it appears, that wants to work for Microsoft from OpenAI. So you have this sort of warring faction within open ai and you have this very very wealthy company saying you're welcome to come over this way and so open ai now is in real chaos open ai can absolutely survive i think the real issue though is if they were to lose hundreds of highly skilled people it's very hard to replace those people particularly those engineers there aren't that many of them and they are incredibly highly sought after in silicon valley and elsewhere james clayton in san francisco The US President Joe Biden says he believes a deal to secure the release of some of the hostages abducted by Hamas from southern Israel is getting nearer. Asked by a reporter at the annual Thanksgiving ceremony in Washington about whether the rumoured deal was near, Mr Biden crossed his fingers and replied, I believe so. Mr President, is a hostage deal near? I believe so. I'm not prepared to talk to you. believe so? Yes. The U.S. also says that fuel has reached Gaza following Israel's announcement it would allow limited supplies to support non-governmental organisations there. The White House National Security spokesman John Kirby had this update. Over the 18th and the 19th of November, almost 100 trucks carrying humanitarian aid were able to enter Gaza. That brings the total to over 1,260. And then following uh, Israel's announcement that it's allowing fuel now into Gaza to support non-governmental organizations at our strong request, we are now tracking that six trucks have crossed into Gaza with approximately 18,000 gallons of fuel. That will help support food distribution and it will help generators for the hospital so that they can keep working. Earlier on Monday, the Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza said at least 12 people were killed in an Israeli strike on the Indonesian hospital in the Palestinian territory. The Indonesian foreign minister condemned Israel's action and said it was a clear violation of humanitarian law. Israel says its troops had been firing at, quote, terrorists inside the hospital who'd been shooting at them. Meanwhile, 28 premature babies evacuated from Gaza's biggest hospital, Al-Shifa, have now arrived in Egypt for urgent treatment. We'll hear more about the possible hostage negotiations in a moment, but first I got an update on what's been happening in Gaza from our Middle East correspondent, Tom Bateman. Well, what we've seen is an increasing military focus on some of Gaza's hospitals, particularly in the north, and the centrepiece of that has obviously been the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City. Israel alleges Hamas used the hospital and a tunnel network underneath, it says, as a command and control centre culminating last night in a video it released that it said was a Hamas tunnel running underneath the hospital and also clips of what it said was CCTV security camera footage from the hospital which showed the Israelis said two hostages foreign nationals being taken into the hospital by Hamas when they were snatched on the day of the atrocities themselves now one of those people in the footage is clearly injured on a hospital trolley inside the other one is being sort of wrestled quite aggressively into the hospital it appears by gunmen and Israel says these are Hamas militants so some potentially really significant evidence there whether or not they've got to the point of being able to prove this is a command and control center it doesn't feel like they've got to that and this matters because under international law an attack on a hospital is prohibited unless the hospital is used for military purposes it can lose that protection but any attack on a hospital under international rules has to be proportionate to the military advantage that will be gained basically israel is saying that another october the 7th could take place if these hospitals aren't attacked and therefore it needs to show that is basically the basis of the fact that it besieged the gaza strip and effectively cut off the functioning of these hospitals and of course it also wants to get the hostages out we've heard talk that a, a deal is close president biden saying the same again today what are you hearing For 24 hours now, there has been a growing sense that a deal is close. And I think it's really significant that we've had President Biden in response to the question, is a hostage deal close? He has said uh, yes. John Kirby, the national security spokesperson, also saying the deal to release the hostages is getting closer. Tom Bateman in Jerusalem. The United Nations says emissions of greenhouse gases must fall by 42% by 2030 to reach the goal of limiting global warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. 
It's calling on countries to show much greater ambition. In a report released as countries gear up for next week's big climate summit, COP28 in Dubai. Our correspondent Neda Talfiq in New York told Tim Franks about the latest UN findings. Well, it shows that greenhouse gas emissions are reaching all-time highs when really those levels should be shooting down. So we saw a 1.2% increase in greenhouse gas emissions last year, and that's really causing temperature records. I mean, June, July, August, September, October were all the hottest on record. In fact, this year is looking to be the hottest on record. And the Secretary General spoke about the fact that unless greenhouse gas emissions fall by 42% in six years, that we won't be able to get to that. That 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. And he said, if you look at it, the emissions report today shows that 22 gigatons we will be higher in emissions than the 1.5 degree limit allows. And he says that is the total present annual emissions of the U.S., China and the EU combined. We hear that these massive cuts have to happen, as you pointed out, by 2030. Does the UNEP give any suggestion that we are on course for that? They say there's just a 14 percent chance of avoiding overshooting the 1.5 degree limit in the best case scenario. So they say we have to have economies going to phase out fossil fuels much faster. And if you look at the kind of 20 biggest economies in the world right now, they aren't cutting emissions at a rate consistent with their net zero targets. And so they say we're more likely on track to warm by nearly three degrees Celsius this century. In terms of the damage to the the world, it would be utterly catastrophic. Scientists refer to it as the point of no return, talking about runaway melting ice sheets in, the, in Antarctica, the Amazon rainforest drying out. For the Secretary General, he's planning a trip into Chile, Antarctica, to try to see for himself what he thinks is the deadly impact of this crisis and what it's going to look like if leaders don't go to COP with a kind of clear understanding that they have to scale up their commitments to renewable transition. They need to help those who aren't the biggest polluters but who need financing and need help with their economies to transition. And I think that's the kind of key message from the UN, that there is just a failure in leadership right now. Neda Tofik at UN headquarters in New York talking to Tim Franks. More than 200 people have been sentenced to jail in Italy in the biggest anti-mafia trial in decades. The case targeted the country's most powerful criminal syndicate, the Ndrangheta, which is based in the southern Italian region of Calabria, but which dominates Europe's cocaine trade. Anna Sergi is Professor of Criminology and Organised Crime at Essex University here in England. She's also the author of the book Chasing the Mafia and has been following proceedings closely. It's a massive trial over 300 people in front of the court. However, the actual people who are on this trial are not that relevant. They are people who have committed a series of crimes, mostly soldiers and middlemen and a few bosses, but only limited to a specific province of Calabria, Valencia, which is not the main province where notoriously the Ndrangheta comes from. It will have a big meaning for the community, for sure, but whether or not this is a blow to the whole of the Ndrangheta, I doubt so. What can be learned? One thing is to have an helicopter view on a territory, try and target the whole of the clan activities and the connections across clans to photograph a territory in its entirety. The second lesson is to link the mafia activities to activities of politicians and entrepreneurs and everyone who supports mafia activities but does not belong to mafias. So mafias cannot exist without these uh, politicians and entrepreneurs. So we got some heavy sentences for some of the politicians involved. However, some of them were also absolved. <laughs> it's a very slippery slope of when does the political maneuvering begin and the mafia protection ends. In a way, this trial's biggest result has been to make the population of that province particularly aware of the problem. The mafias are not invincible, but the problem we have is that we struggle to understand where they start and where they end with the rigor that is required by criminal law. Anna Sergi, Professor of Criminology and Organised Crime. In many cities around the world, young people are struggling with stratospheric rents. North America is one of the worst affected regions, as can be seen by a listing in the Canadian city of Toronto that's gone viral after it was spotted by a real estate agent. Just when you thought the Toronto rental market couldn't get any worse, it did. I present to you shared bedroom in a lake-facing downtown condo for $900 a month. And for that price, the two roommates have to share a bed. 
The Global News podcast's Stephanie Prentice used to live in Toronto. Back in 2016, when I moved there, I had a very different experience. I had two bedrooms and a pool for the cost of my London one bed. But for this person in today's market, yep, they're asking for 650 US dollars for a situation where the two tenants sleep together in the same bed. And the agent who found this listing points out this is a queen size bed. So she says not even room to create some sort of pillow divider for privacy. But the fact the market is even in that situation where a pillow divider discussion would be taken seriously is very telling and we know the market in Toronto has been spiking year on year. Now the comment section on this viral video has turned into some sort of therapy session for young renters. One writes that he paid $750 a month to sleep on a sofa with no kitchen or bathroom access. Another comments that in Halifax, which is seen as a more affordable part of Canada, people are renting out their balconies during the summer for people to sleep on with their belongings in boxes beside them. Someone in China said young people there are doing it too and saying they've got rules like no snoring, no sleepwalking and no romantic guests. This is a problem, of course, in London too. What is going on with these rent rises everywhere around the world? The short answer for why it's happening across the board is basically supply and demand. Demand is up since people returned to major cities after the peak of those COVID lockdowns. At the same time, we've seen mortgage rates increasing and construction decreasing in many places. And the shock of that is obviously being compounded by the cost of living crisis. We've got salaries generally remaining stagnant in many sectors, meaning, of course, people can't save for a deposit to buy and they're stuck in that cycle of renting. All of that naturally will be felt hardest at the bottom end of income brackets and does explain why a young person may get desperate enough to advertise for a sleeping buddy. Stephanie Prentice. And still to come on the Global News Podcast. Amazing how sweet the sound. The enduring power of Amazing Grace 250 years after it was written by an English slave owner. Argentina's next president, Javier Millet, is unconventional to say the least, whether taking a chainsaw to a rally or pledging to burn down the central bank and scrap the nation's currency. Now, in his first interview since his resounding victory, he said he intends to privatise the state energy company, public broadcasters and the state news agency. Everything that could be, would be put in the hands of the private sector, he said. After his challenger, the centrist Sergio Massa conceded, Mr Millet promised change was on its way. To all those looking on from outside Argentina, I want to say to you all that Argentina will return to its place in the world that it should never have lost. We're going to work shoulder to shoulder with all nations of the free world to help build a better world. Today is a historic night, not just for us, but it's because it's the end of a certain way of politics and the start of another. Mr Malay also confirmed that his first trips abroad will be to the United States and Israel. Maria Esperanza Casulo is a political scientist and professor at the National University of Rio Negro. She's also the author of Why Does Populism Work? Evan Davis asked her what the mood was like in Argentina following Sunday's result. It's quite muted. It's hard to read. There was a very clear protest vote in anger, but there's not a huge outpouring of support. On the one hand, the root cause is a deep feeling of anger in the face of the bad economic situation. Argentina has been in an economic crisis for the last eight years. Inflation is really high. There's also the question of why the electorate voted for the most radical opposition candidate. What are the public expecting? Are they taking him literally when he says he's going to sack half the the civil servants and abolish the central bank and use dollars in Argentina? Was that just campaign talk? I think the one promise that Millet has done that really connected with parts of the electorate was the dollarization. In Argentina, when you cannot buy dollars, you cannot buy a car or you cannot travel abroad. 
when you ask the majority of Millet voters, do you think he's going to be able to do what he says he's going to do? People say, no, no, he's too extreme. There's no way that he's going to be able to privatize public education or there's no way he's going to privatize pensions. There's this ambivalence in his voters that we'll have to see whether these people come to support his policies or there's a backlash and the sense of betrayal. I was reading on Twitter, Act, someone saying, this guy isn't a change. Argentina is often voting for charismatic, incompetent people. This is a person who's very against Millet. Is that true? Because we do sort of think of Argentina as almost the home of populism, a tendency to vote for populism, thinking really of Eva Perón. Yeah, populism and this sort of more personalistic, antagonistic profile in the public figures are important in the Argentine political culture, which is something that you don't find in Chile or in Uruguay. They don't like this type of politicians. But Argentines kind of do. It's interesting because even people who are extremely anti peronist like Millet voters today, or even throughout the 20th century, they continue to gripe against populism. But when they choose to vote for somebody, they choose people that have sort of the same characteristics, this larger than life, very polarizing figures. Even before Millet, you can think, for example, in Carlos Menem in the 90s, who actually implemented some of the more neoliberal policies that Millet is calling back to now. And he was also this uh, larger than life figure. Maria Esperanza Carsulo talking to Evan Davis. You may be surprised to know that thousands of Russians are living in Ukraine nearly two years after their nation launched its full scale invasion of the country. Some are even fighting in Ukraine's army. But life in Ukraine isn't straightforward. They say they can't access basic services without a Ukrainian passport. And to get one, they need to travel to Russia to surrender their Russian citizenship. Our Ukraine correspondent James Waterhouse reports. In a tiny village in Ukraine's central Venetia region, Galina spends her pregnancy stitching T-shirts for wounded soldiers. Galina is in a limbo. She's desperate to escape. She would describe herself as a normal Ukrainian. She was born here. She speaks and feels Ukrainian, but the country sees her as a Russian. Changing your passport was difficult even before the war. Now it's just impossible. She got it when she moved there as a child with her family. Now, back in Ukraine, Galina can't get work. She can't access free health care and her bank account is at risk of being blocked. Her relationship with Ukraine is intertwined. She married Maxim, a Ukrainian soldier, in a church. The officials refused to register our marriage. They said, come back when you have a passport. In order to get a Ukrainian passport, she says she has to surrender her Russian citizenship, either in a Russian consulate or Russia itself. She's afraid she wouldn't make it back. On one main road in central Kiev sits this three-storey white building. The garden is overgrown. It's surrounded by a barbed wire fence. This is the Russian embassy. We're here to meet Anastasia, a Russian who's experienced a long gravitational pull towards Ukraine. Anastasia left Russia in 2015 after getting tired of the propaganda there. She's now a combat medic for Ukrainian forces. What went through your mind on that morning of the 24th of February? Okay, we're going to fight. Once I choose Ukraine as my homeland, I couldn't betray this choice. Were you seen differently because you were Russian or did that not matter? Nobody was asking my passport and my nationality when I was working. For sure, my colleagues, they know this is what I'm fighting for, not only for freedom and for my passport. But can or should Ukraine make the system simpler for Russians living in the country? We're now at the State Migration Service in Kiev to speak to Natalia Naumenko. Who's in charge of it? If a person identifies as a Ukrainian, that is not a reason to issue them with a Ukrainian passport. No citizens from any country is discriminated against. If they have proper grounds to apply with a list of documents, they must provide. Natalia argues the process has been made simpler for those fighting. But with the full-scale invasion, she asks... Why does Ukraine have to simplify it for all Russian citizens? Back in Galina's idyllic village, 
she finds a moment to video call her husband Maxim on the front line. Привет. Ну як ти там? If something happened to your husband, what would that mean for your family given your situation? I'm afraid to even think about it. If he gets wounded, I wouldn't be able to visit him in hospital. To anyone else in the world, we are strangers. It's very scary. An anxiety she tries to keep at the back of her mind, again at the forefront. That report from Ukraine by James Waterhouse. A human rights group in Cambodia says clothing waste from Adidas, Walmart and more than a dozen other big firms is being burnt as cheap fuel in brick factories and some workers are falling ill. Photos taken by investigators from the Cambodian League for the Promotion and Defence of Human Rights show piles of fabric, rubber and scraps of plastic. Cambodia is an important manufacturer for many leading brands and waste is supposed to be disposed of in approved recycling centres or waste-to-energy plants. Our Asia-Pacific regional editor Celia Hatton told me more. Cambodia has a huge garment industry, 700,000 people making, stitching, clothing, shoes, bags for big name brands. There's a lot of waste created, but it seems that some of this waste, according to the report, it's being diverted and sold off to brick factories. They took photos of what they discovered there. You could see mountains, just huge piles of what looked like scraps of fabric and rubber and plastic, but many of these things were stamped with the labels of the companies that they seem to have been made for. Lululemon, Lidl, Disney, The Gap, Reebok, Adidas. It was very clear where these things had come from. So this stuff is being burnt by these brick factories as fuel. What does that mean for the workers there? The workers at the kiln factories and people living around the factories are reporting things like migraines, respiratory problems. The report even mentioned one pregnant woman who said she'd been having problems during her pregnancy because she'd been living next to these brick factories. And so some quite disturbing things. So will anything be done to stop this kind of thing happening? What are the firms saying? I spoke to Adidas. They got back to me very, very quickly saying that they had launched their own investigation to try to figure out how their factory waste ended up beside these brick factories. They didn't discount the findings of this report and they were quite clear that they had quite strict environmental policies. Other companies have seemingly ignored this report. They haven't gotten back to the authors of this report. So, so far, we haven't heard anything from The Gap or Disney, for example. Other companies, Primark, Lidl, both say they're investigating and so there's a mixture. Celia Hatton reporting. US researchers say they may have discovered why some people get a headache after just one small glass of red wine. The investigators at the University of California believe they've identified a compound in red grapes that can change how the body metabolizes alcohol. More details from our health reporter Michelle Roberts. Several theories have been put forward for red wine headaches that can strike within 30 minutes of drinking even small amounts. Some blame preservatives that prolong the shelf life of wine. Others say it could be a blood vessel expander called histamine, another ingredient that's more common in red wine than whites or rosés. Now a US team lists another possible culprit, an antioxidant called quercetin that red grapes make lots of in the sun. Expensive wines like Napa Valley Cabernet 